most of us never realize, as we stuff our faces with the sanitized swill of premium content providers, is that there is a wealth of free entertainment just a few clicks away. While it is by no means the be-all and end-all of online video, there are approximately 1.3 billion YouTube users, and 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. In that great cesspit of screaming clickbait, it is easy for films to fall between the cracks, swiftly buried by an eternal stream of effluence. But what of those fallen and forgotten films, swept away and buried beneath the landslide of portly cats, facepalm fails and belligerent reaction videos? Strap on your favourite hazmat suit and join Indie Film Library as we take a deep dive into the internet's most popular video sewer. Journey with us as we rake through the muck, sifting through the turds in the hope of unearthing some diamonds for your viewing pleasure. Welcome to Tube Rats. Welcome to episode three of Tube Rats, the show where we scour the filthy crevices of the internet in search of cinematic gold. Having previously focused on apocalyptic shorts and horror films, some bright sparks said it would be nice to do something a bit more upbeat. So this week we're focusing on short musicals. I'm Indie Film Library Chief Editor Jack Brindelli, and joining me to gaze into the void Known locally as the Fiddler on the Roof, it's comedian Jimmy Radiger. Good to be here as always, Jack. I'm very excited for Musical Week. Despite looking like I hang around in graveyards, I'm actually a big fan of musicals. So um, I've, I've really enjoyed this week. It makes you quite appropriate for one of our later musicals, actually. I was um, personally very in invested in it, I've got to say. Well, I look forward to hearing all of your thoughts <laughs> and in-depth... Uh, there is many, yeah. <laughs> on. And uh, this week's special guest, an all-singing, all-dancing member of the Indie Film Library team, he can show you the world after both. Um, hey Jack, it's good to be here. Um, all-singing um, may be right. I, I do enjoy music, but I have never danced to save my life and I can't. I'd rather no one sees me dance. Um, but it's good to be here and I'm really excited about this week's team. I'm not sure it's as um, bright and cheery as it sounds, but uh, we, we'll get we'll have more on that later. Fantastic. Well, um, after what uh, do you have any particular insights on the, uh, the musical interest industry at all? Uh, you busk obviously as a side, uh, a side hustle. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, well, the fact is that, I mean, busking is uh, pretty much the antithesis of the musical industry. It's uh, it's very much uh, a grassroots uh, on the street, uh, making your own money, not going through a label or, uh, or a publisher. So um, in that sense, um, not really, but I have auditioned for a mu few musicals in the past and it's oh, um, really Which yeah ones? well <laughs> well i've uh, i've actually auditioned for um yeah i did like beauty and the beast back in india but then when i was in the netherlands i they came around calling for people to do um auditions for aladdin like uh which the, the guy Ritchie one that has come out now and actually Fucking yeah, yeah <laughs> i actually did uh i actually just uh just on a whim i just sent in a, an audition for the for the lead um and yeah, I got an email saying, um, yeah, we've uh, we've shortlisted you for the last 15 and Guy Ritchie is looking at your audition now. But then, uh, yeah, a week later, it was like, yeah, we, we picked someone else. So, but yeah, so that's my experience with the musical industry. It's been, uh, it's very, uh, it's more corporate than you would imagine, more cutthroat, more, um, wow. more direct. You, uh, you aren't the first person to have been the victim of Guy Ritchie's taste levels, <laughs> and you shouldn't want to be the last.
okay, so that brings us to tonight's first film. So, charting the course of Tom Waits' psychotic break as he attempts to assemble flat pack furniture, Victor Dubnia's Who's Asking About That is a two minute freeform jazz nightmare. Unfortunately, Jimmy and Aftab both vetoed it because it was simply too stylish for them to handle. So instead, I have to talk about Greed, a 10 minute <laughs> <laughs> musical film that will divide audiences on whether it can be referred to as a musical or indeed a film. From the unhinged mind of visionary avant-garde writer-director Riston Rodriguez, the film is a non-linear collage of seemingly disconnected characters and motives, examining the futility of our fleeting and banal lives as we dance on the edge of a cold and indifferent void. As what resembles a lead character shunts countless others into the pit of oblivion in a vain attempt to keep his own mortality at bay, we are left to ruminate on our own hopeless slide into the grave and the infinite blanket of darkness which awaits us. I think the, the important argument we're going to have here is whether this is a film, a musical, or a very well, well, a choreographed routine at least. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to try and explain why that is, it's a musical in the way that there's music, but it's not original music, and I think it's just been dubbed over the top of a routine that the actors slash uh, dancers have learned. So in my mind, because there's not original music, and also, I guess, because they're not actually singing the music, I, I feel like you can't really call this one a musical. So that's a great start to musical week, in, in my opinion, at least. <laughs> That's a, that's a fair point. I mean, um, the problem is when, when, I, when I select these films, I, it is basically just a random kind of YouTube Google exercise where I type in short film musical 2021 or whatever, and Greed insisted that it was a musical. It was retained in all of my searches. So at that point, I put it in the list on good faith. Lo and behold, they don't sing. They <laughs> scarcely dance. It's just a, a film about a violent assault, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a violent assault on the streets of India carried out by a gang of um, extremely light-handed people because the, the fight scene... <laughs> um, I've, I've described it in my notes as... Do you know, like, when you have, like, a big fight scene, like in, like, say, like, Avengers or a big Hollywood blockbuster... And you've got, say, like Captain America and someone at the front, and you're watching them, and every blow is connected, and you're really invested. But then, like, sometimes if you just look out into the distance, there's a couple of extras who are fighting, and it's just kind of like a back and forth kind of slapping, and, and they're, it, like, they're like three foot away from ever making contact of each other. Like, that's what this fight scene is. It's essentially it's a close up of those background characters who didn't know they were being filmed. Which I really enjoyed, um, if I'm honest, but it wasn't like <laughs> the best fight scene I've ever seen, uh, is, is the best way, the nicest way of putting that. Yeah, well, I mean, so, I mean, coming back to what we were talking about, whether it's musical, I, I would say that I think what they were going for is um, maybe that music is literally the only audio that we hear from the whole film. But in uh, the traditional definition, I would say it's more like a more of a silent movie than uh, than anything else. But that's if we're continuing it to call it a movie, as uh, as Jimmy put it, it's more like a, somewhere between a routine and a dance and and a <clears throat> choreographed fight scene, where uh, more more of an artistic fight scene. Let's just say it's a it's an artistic representation of a fight rather than a fight itself. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think Jack put the the emotion of the film perfectly when he uh, when he when he introduced it. It's certainly warm and fuzzy. Is not is not what you leave uh, greed uh, feeling. And uh, it's yeah, it's uh, it's definitely it definitely comes from a dark place. I uh, yeah, I, I stand by my uh, <laughs> definition of greed. Um, it does all of the things that I said it does. Um, it just does them really badly uh, <laughs> and I know uh, a few minutes before recording this Jimmy you've said that uh, people had asked us to be uh, more descriptive about the films that we'd watch because they don't always really want to see what we've seen which is understandable uh, so you know I was just wondering if I could gauge 
uh, both of your opinions on what you think the story actually was for this film, <clears> just <throat> for the sake of uh, our listeners. I have no idea. I don't know what I watched. <laughs> um, with the past and technical world. Um, I don't know what I watched. There was some, some fake punching towards the end. Um, I couldn't honestly tell you what the plot was. I assume someone had been greedy, hence the title of the film. <laughs> that's, that's all I can tell you about this film. It happened to me, and I can't really say much more than that. <laughs> After any 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 luck? Well, I mean, I would say I have like a pretty detailed overview of exactly what happened. Um, it be yeah, it begins. Um, it all begins with a with a with a gang territory kind of fight where uh, these um, these violent thugs follow another violent thug into his territory, um, and he has his own even more violent thug to protect him, and so they have to back off, um, and then. Uh, Basically, they find they engineer a way where they can bribe Violent Tug A to kill Violent Tug B and therefore gain all territory. Uh, and they give him a fact check. And Violent Tug B, for some reason, uh, not only kills, um, sorry, Violent Tug A here, sorry, losing the blood a bit, not only kills uh, Violent Tug B, but he also kills his. Um, uh, his uh, sick brother, uh, just because the movie wasn't dark enough, uh, and uh, and then we're um, yeah, and in the end, uh, Violent Tug A and his associate Violent Tug C um, end up learning an important lesson because they chased um, the money and betrayed their friend, and in the end, the group of thugs kills them all and uh, takes the territory. So that's the story of greed. Um, and the moral is uh, just uh, stay loyal and don't be greedy. That's that is uh, <laughs> stupendous. Um, I think I think we should elaborate on a couple of things there. Then, firstly, um, the, the well, they're both prop related. Firstly, we have the fact check, which is literally a like it's a check, right? It's like you would think that a street gang would pay for right. for a murder in cash, presumably <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and not signed. Um, and secondly, you have uh, <laughs> the ailing brother who uh, who doesn't factor in most of the film and suddenly appears uh, as his uh, brother, the hitman, is ladling vast quantities of water onto his closed lips. <laughs> <laughs> in order to care for him um which i guess you know if your if your livelihood depends on killing people you're not particularly good at actually taking care of them maybe but it didn't seem that useful in the grand scheme of things what did uh, what did we actually think at least of the we've talked about this being quite choreographed almost as a dance piece what did you, what did we think of the actual dancing that took place i think that Given that there was no dialogue, very little resource, um, I would say that they managed to convey a certain amount of the emotion. But aside from that, in terms of making it look like a real scenario, as uh, Jimmy said about the fighting or uh, even taking care of an ailing brother, they <clears throat> there were some, let's say, motor skills that were lacking. But I would say that on the whole, uh, <laughs> on the whole, the the acting. There was certainly commitment to the role. There was certainly uh, immersion in the in the atmosphere. Um, so I think they did a they did a pretty good job under the circumstances. Well, it, that that is your right to be, <laughs> to be kind. Um, I think it, it's a good reflection on you and a poor reflection on the black and the abyss that is my soul. That <laughs> I can't be kind to these people, unfortunately. I mean, what I've put is that it's not for me, but the comment section was filled with people who seemed to really enjoy it. They're like, hey, it's not something I would watch again, but, you know, the fact that Aftab was able to, to understand it, um, or, like, seemingly even get a semblance of a plot out of it, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, it, it kind of means that they met what they were trying to do. So I can't completely, like, shit all over it, if I'm honest. It's, it's not my kind of thing to begin with, although I do like a good hammy fight scene wherever I can get one. They did what they were, like, trying to do, 
some people enjoyed it, the close family and friends, I think, mostly, and we'll take up. That's, that's better than most of my YouTube videos do, so. Okay, um, so um, are we recommending? Oh, no. Uh, I, would, I would say that if there is someone in my life who is struggling to feel something and is numb inside, I would recommend the movie to uh, jolt them into, um, well, I don't know, some kind of... Uh, Suicide? <laughs> well just anything I, I, it it seems like the kind of um, extremity that would get you to feel this is a very kind of early 1900s approach to psychotherapy I feel <laughs> like you've, you've met someone with shell shock and so your response is to give them like ice baths and electrotherapy it's yeah, greed yeah. or the gallows for you I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know what, on this occasion, um, I don't recommend it for general consumption, but I think people who are listening to this should see what we are talking about, because there are a lot of points that probably have faded to the back of our, our minds, because it's just such a rich tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there are many things that you see first, second, third viewing that, that we didn't pick up on and that you didn't pick up on. on oh, a hundred, hundred percent. Like some of the background stuff is incredible. Like people forget what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if, if, I, I would watch, to be honest, I would recommend. On that basis, yes, I'll recommend it. On other basis is, no, I won't, I'm afraid. Sorry, Riston Rodriguez. My heart hit the floor I've never felt this way before Now all I see Is you and me For all my life and maybe more We'll have the perfect life together I see the dream in your eyes We'll have the perfect life together Okay, so this week I'm introducing, uh, it's called The Perfect Life, directed by Omar Benson. Um, it's a very short film, this one. Uh, the video is only 3 minutes 38, and a good chunk of that is actually just the credits. Uh, so I've got this described as a local escapee from psychiatric unit slash theatre group hangs around in elevators looking to create artificial moments with any woman who stumbles in. Uh, they do like the kind of, oh god, we're both on going to the same floor, we must fuck thing, when um, they both reach for the same button. And he has like a psychotic episode where he imagines them doing cutesy stuff together, like cooking together, long walks in the park. I liked how tongue-in-cheek this was. Like, it was obviously a parody of um, like that kind of standard romantic kind of thing. When they cut away from his little sort of daydream of cutesiness, like, you just see him staring normally at a very visibly distressed and freaked out woman who he's only just met. Um, and I thought it was actually quite funny. I thought I managed to do what they were trying to do quite well. Um, and it subverted our expectations at the end. So yeah, that's, uh, what do you guys think of this one? As Jimmy said, there's not much to pick out from. Uh, I, I think like uh, I'll relay my journey of watching the movie. It was uh, at, for the first um, 45 seconds when when he's when he breaks out into a dance and they they're having their whole uh, life together, I was kind of wondering what um, why um, because it was uh, basically just a classic scene from any given film put into context with um, lower quality dancing. But uh, but then I I mean at the end I thought the twist was quite nice that um, that it's a guy who does this uh, regularly. It, uh, I guess the idea is to try to make you think. I don't know what you're supposed to think about, but it definitely <laughs> gives you a, <laughs> it gives you a, a bit of a, a bit of a twist at the end, and you're, uh, you're, you're left with a mildly creepy feeling, but it still uh, keeps its humor. So yeah, I thought it was, uh, it was short, sweet, um, gave you a bit of a, a shock. Uh, so yeah, did the job, I would say. Uh, I would agree with that. 
the uh, the protagonist well the protagonist who then turns out to be more of an antagonist he seems like uh, the internal monologue of a, like a grotesque neckbeard um <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's how those people like perceive themselves. He's the nice guy, isn't he? And, like all of those kind of situations. Right down to that hat. What is that hat that they all wear? The, the, the fedora. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah fedora. And yeah. You know, he, yeah. He said he's a nice, pleasant guy. Um, and so this is his like mirror reflection that he sees. And then it, I would, I would have liked like a cut where we saw him. Like as as the neck beard, uh, yeah, where he's just sort of like breathing heavily through his mouth while looking at this woman really closely. I, I guess it was a decent balance for that reason of, of getting that kind of message across without like bashing you over the head with it. Um, just in terms of its its technical prowess, um, I don't know the first thing about singing. Obviously, you can tell from my rich melodic tones on here that uh, it's not much of a voice but this this guy um and and the woman as well both their pitch kind of irked me like it was all one note and quite high pitched but i don't know if if that was appropriate after have you know a bit more about singing than i do yeah well i mean i thought they 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 hit the notes and they did the right moves but i do i would say that they're clearly not either professional singers or professional dancers, they're more actors and uh, they are singing and dancing. And so they did the job, but um, I say, I would say the idea of the musical was more the, the, the twist than it was the actual uh, entertainment. Yeah, I, I, I've got down the run notes. I don't think they were the strongest singers. Having a quick like look through the comments, I think a lot of that might have been down to the mixing as well. Um, some of the comments were that it was mixed quite poorly and it didn't seem to... Uh, to sound quite right to some people, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give them the benefit of it out and say that might have been more of a an editing thing than a than the actual singers. Yes, that's a fair point, I suppose. Um, but also as well, there was um, there was obviously there was some choreography. It wasn't just the two of them. Uh, there was also supposed to be like a kind of I guess a backing chorus that suddenly emerges. <laughs> yeah, and it consists of three people, <laughs> so it's not. It's not a big kind of Bob Fosse number. You, were you underwhelmed by that? Or is that just, you have to kind of adjust your expectations to this kind of... I, I think it, it managed what it was trying to do. I think it was trying to, to parody those like old kind of like 1920s, 1930s kind of films, you know, right down to his costume. And like the dance and style was that kind of like, you know, Fred Astaire. You, know, you could also imagine them were having like canes and dancing around one of them or something as well. So I thought it was kind of like simple, but it, it did the job. It wasn't anything special, but I, I think it managed to fit in with like a theme of the film and what they were trying to do. Yeah, hundred percent. I would say, yeah, it definitely got that vibe of uh, of uh, of that era, as uh, Jimmy said. But uh, I would say that my expectations, you know, from already seeing the timestamp or the time uh, duration of the film was, you can al already kind of tell it's not going to be like, uh, it's not going to blow you away. I don't know if that's an unreasonable uh, expectation, but also um, just the fact that, yeah, I would say that you run the risk of this uh, with any film that is that short is that you kind of, you get a lot of different points and things across but none of them really uh you driven home uh i think that's kind of what it what it was it's just a nice vibe and some kind of plot twist and that's about it it was a uh, yeah i guess it was a nice vibe and i suppose the, the the cycle continues after the ending uh, as well unfortunately the guy doesn't seem to have learned any any kind of lesson what I tend to do when we watch these films is I tend to I try and do a little bit of uh you know I do a couple of Google searches of like the the actors and everything like that uh, just as like a side to see if they've done anything else. It's a completely useless trivia fact, but the lead guy in this, Jay Collinskin, I think it is his name. I won't be able to pronounce it because Collinskin. He, uh, he now seems to make a living starring exclusively in like those kind of hallmark like holiday films. I suppose it's enough to get yourself a SAG membership so that, that, that it's a living, as they say. 
It's a living. I mean, we're making this podcast about him, so he's off for now, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And he gets paid substantially better for that than we do for this. Oh yeah, but he gets paid full stuff. I don't know. I think I think we've kind of almost exhausted this film because there's not a lot of meat on the bones, to be honest. Three thirty-eight. Um, it's a it's a scarce running time. It works. Would you say as a uh, kind of showreel for what the actors, directors, writers are capable of? Yeah, pretty much all I've got for it, to be honest. W- would you recommend that one? Uh, yeah, I would say that I would. Um, I would recommend it. I don't know what I would put in front of that recommendation on why people should watch it, but I would just say it's a it's a short, nice film to watch. But that's about it. I mean, I think. As as you've seen from his his career trajectory, it kind of worked out for them as a as a a, a demo tape, uh, and I would recommend it on this basis. I think all of these people are deserving of further work. They're competent. Um, they have a little bit of imagination, not not like insane amounts, but uh, yeah, uh, I think I would recommend it. Um, I, actually, just doing a little bit of immediate research here. It says here that the musical short film was made for a 48-hour film contest. It's actually pretty impressive. Usually, I think those films are utterly terrible, like uniquely ghastly. So yeah, they've actually they've managed to put something together that doesn't seem like it actually was a 48-hour film contest, because I have no idea up until I've just read this blurb. Jimmy, would you recommend it? Yeah, I think I would. I, you know, for, for what it was, I quite enjoyed it. It was a short film. It was funny. Uh, it wasn't like my kind of music, but it was, you know, it managed to to kind of showcase the actors. Just having a quick look as well. Um, so Joanne Roberts, who plays the lead female, has also moved on to different kind of bit parts and uh, television series and stuff since then as well. So I think, you know, what you're saying is right. I think like it's a uh, it must have been quite a good show reel for what they were doing because they've both gone on to to more things. Would you care to introduce Emo the musical? With pleasure, Jack. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose of the three films we've talked about here today, Emo is actually the one that best fits the description of a musical in that uh, in that there are singers and actors and it ties in well with the plot. And also just that most of the key messages actually in uh, emo are are delivered via song um i think the first the very first line of the movie that's done perfectly sunshine the worst possible way to start the morning um is pretty much how um you would say sums up the emo mindset but emo the film is not necessarily uh, a deep dive into that mindset i would say emo is um i would describe it as a high school romance set to a background score of Weird Al Yankovic meets Blink-182. Um, it's, uh, it has, it has, it's a classic love story. It has all the themes of uh, Romeo and Juliet, of warring worlds, of uh, Christ meets Antichrist. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it has, um, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's basically, to sum it up in just one line, it's, um, it's a high school romance between a between an emo, dark uh, teenager, and a kind of almost Mormon like girl who who just um, who's a church going, complete purist um, values, and uh, how their worlds don't necessarily let them uh, uh, let them you know uh, get together. 
but i think i think the highlight of this film is actually the music i think uh, it's pretty well written it comes across nicely it sounds good and uh, they've managed to slip in some uh, some real gems um like some of the lines in these songs are just amazing like one of them has a chorus which go, just goes we're all going to die one of them uh, slips in even if you don't come to my su suicide pact on friday i don't mind um and then the same song later delivers uh, you me and god in a three way and uh, it's just uh, you know like they managed to slip in these real gems through the music um and the music is actually what carries the film through i think but the best part is that that is that isn't even the weirdest part about the movie like they there's just this four minute four minute barrage of action uh in the middle uh where i would say there's um kind of a war between this emo rock band and uh these um church going kids and uh it features it features literally everything it features a blood condom uh it features pigeons in a locker a bag full of piss uh fingerprints an expulsion loyalty and reconciliation and i think to put all of that into one movie and that's not even the main message of the movie is um it's pretty impressive from the, the director and writer of the movie neil trifid or trifid i'm not quite sure how to pronounce that for all its funny light and uh, let's say mildly superficial scenes i would say that emo actually has a pretty powerful message in the end um in that you can love people without uh, without necessarily uh, having the same faith and i actually did some more research into neil trifid and um, and i found uh, this interview he did online where he because he actually later turned the short into a feature film um and he talks about how emo is actually a really important uh, concept for him because it's one of the few youth movements that has actually um gained traction amongst uh, a vast let's say share of the world's youth um a movement that defies like not only defies like notions of happiness and notions of all, you know put making yourself cheerful all the time and notions of love and faith etc and not only embraces the dark space but it also uh challenges other things that are uh institutionalized in the world uh and he kind of this describes how emo is is a youth movement that enables young people to to question institutions to challenge them uh and i think in that sense there is there is a pretty strong message in the movie but uh as a movie itself it's just a 15 minute fun watch and i i i quite enjoyed it the music the comedy all of it yeah and um, i'm actually really curious to see what you guys think because uh, from a movie connoisseur's perspective it's probably very different okay oh, nicely summed up um well first things first i guess um jimmy as uh, the person with the most background in in the dark arts you should, <laughs> you should probably lead on this discussion yeah um i don't want to like i don't want to be overly critical of this because oh, it was I'll, I'll get to that <laughs> <laughs> like my main criticism of it as a um a big fan of emo music and you know it, it's probably the, the genre i listen to most and so genre i kind of listen to most through my kind of like teen years especially like for emo the musical there was no emo music in emo the musical it was dark like there was dark music and there was very gothic music but i didn't really get that kind of like emo angsty kind of feel to it you have like an artist a go to emo artist that you could maybe use to i have a hundred <laughs> <laughs> who are you thinking of <laughs> Um, I, I mean, off, off the top of my head, obviously, there's sort of very, very, very famous ones like a My Chemical Romance, uh, Taken yeah. Back Sunday. Yeah, I just didn't really feel like it was emo. I felt like it was maybe more goth the musical than emo the musical, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, you know, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. I, I just felt if you're gonna make something called emo the musical, you should probably have some emo music in it. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> I don't know with this one. Like I watched this with Mrs. Jimmy, um, who is is always very critical of things. Um, 
She has a beautiful name, by the way. Mrs. Jimmy. It's very coincidental that I found someone called Mrs. Jimmy, really. <laughs> <laughs> and any other name that could have been very, very complicated, but no, this works well. <laughs> um, and Mrs. Jimmy, uh, she, like when we finished watching this one, uh, she says she just didn't really get what the point was. And I kind of agree with that. Like, I feel like I watched something, but I didn't really al almost get what I was watching. And I'm hoping because, you know, as, as the lesser film person out of, out of the three of us here, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not a very... I'm not, a, we would say, a film buff. I'm definitely just someone who occasionally likes films but doesn't always get it. I'm hoping you guys can can kind of explain it a bit more for me, perhaps. Um, but, I mean, my main takeaway was uh, two people with absolutely nothing in common bond over a mutual love of nothing in common. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the songs were... They, they, they were okay. Um, a lot of them were kind of, like, sort of funny. They had funny lines in them. And, you know, critique aside about what genre they would be. But I don't think they were kind of songs that you'd listen to, like, over and over again. They were kind of, like, they were kind of funny songs that you listen to once and like, oh, that was quite good. But then I don't think I'd ever listen to it again. So I'm not 100% certain it really meets what it was trying to do. And I can't really tell if, like, the songs were meant to be parody or if they were, like, just not very good sometimes. <laughs> It, it's, I don't know, with this one, it was like an enjoyable watch, but I mean, I, I came away from this one more confused in 15 minutes or 16 minutes nearly uh, than I did with A Perfect Life, which realistically was about two and a half minutes. I feel like it did more in two and a half minutes than, than Emo the Musical did in sort of six times that amount. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I'm being a bit harsh. Hopefully, hopefully you guys can can steer me straight on this one. I think, um, from my perspective, this film um, it came it kind of came in waves. Like it uh, lost me, then won me, then lost me again in 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 several kind of uh, movements. But the the opening was the part where I almost instantly checked out. Because, for, yeah, for Emo the Musical, I was expecting something else other than this kind of grotesque Andrew Lloyd Webber, Webber plinky-plunk fucking piano that opens it. And um, the music then, it picks up. Uh, I agree, Jimmy, that I don't think it's particularly emo. Uh, but when their band starts singing about the, the end of the world and uh, we're all going to die, that that was my favorite uh, song and yeah, I think they, they could have done more with that they could have brought that back in some kind of big chorus at the end i think the problem for me was that the character development had to be kind of rushed in a 15 or 16 minute musical uh, and maybe neil triffitt had more room to satisfactorily conclude uh, the plot lines in, in a 90 minute film, which is on Netflix now. All I wrote down as a note for this one is there's a couple of throwaway lines in here. And I feel it's interesting that uh, after you say Neil Trifford thinks that emos kind of uh, examine the structures of society and critique them, because I think that actually there was some really heinously uncritical stuff about structures within society that are just kind of glossed over here. So both groups. You have the, uh, the devout Christians and the emos. Both groups had something overtly homophobic to say. When uh, the main character is seen in a yellow shirt, which, by the way, I, I'm sure some emos have worn yellow before, the lead singer of his band then calls him a fag. <laughs> and that's just the end of that scene. And then uh, the, the, the devout Christians have in their climactic song this whole bit about uh, the fact that God drowns the sodomites. So these are two sides that you, you would think they're about to be shown in the wrong by this couple that are going to get together and be like, screw all of you hate mongers. We don't need to be part of these like secret societies. This is kind of cultish. And it doesn't, it doesn't materialize like that. The resolution doesn't see our protagonist tackle that in any meaningful sense. So the moral to me seemed fudged. What there could have been something but instead, it seems like it comes across as life is just a matter of choosing which brand of kind of casual bigotry you prefer. 
and that's as close as we get to a, a happy ending. So yeah, I, I, you know, I think that on a technical basis, this was my preferred film in chunks of it, but the ending just utterly like lost me in that regard. Yeah, I'm so, just coming coming back to the the fag comment as well. I find it very weird that like a supposed emo would call someone a fag when it seems like half of the the bands and everything are very openly either bisexual, bi curious, and I, I I don't really associate that kind of sort of bigotry or anything with with that kind of I don't know subculture, I guess. Yeah, because I I, I got the impression of the emos that I knew, G Jimmy, you being one of them, that like they they had a kind of more uh, fluid approach to sexuality and to like gender norms and. It's, uh, I mean, you know, that's reflected in their style as well as, well as their attitude. So, like, the kind of use of uh, guy liner and stuff when the alternative was... I think, what was the alternative to emo? I guess it was, like, being... Like, I, I guess in, in England, we called it, like, a chav or something, I guess. Like, a kind of, like, sporting goods and, you know, tracksuit bottoms and everything like that, I, that I guess. That was, like, an overtly kind of, like, male and female kind of gender normative kind of thing. And that the alternative was then emo, which would be, yeah, I would imagine that there are some emo bigots probably somewhere. But um, yeah, to just kind of casually check that in your film and then not address it, I feel is a little bit irresponsible, even, even with a time limit. Because obviously at the end of the day as well, if you're a filmmaker producing an independent film, the time limit is self-imposed. He could have found probably another minute to do something here. But I mean, I think like the way it was put out there, especially the both the comments and especially the one where they're singing about uh, God drowning the Sodomites, at least when I saw that, it was very clearly like it was it was out there because it was so obviously um, uh, fucked up, you know, and it was it was to be seen as that it was to be taken with, with a pinch of salt, obviously. I think the expectation from this film that's the thing. I think the name is fairly misleading because it kind of gives the impression, and especially with the Triffitt's background and what he's talked about before, it gives the impression that it's going to kind of do a deep dive into these these social norms and social issues. And but I think what it eventually focuses on, and and that is full critique of the way it was uh, titled. But what the film actually focuses on is the insecurity and the peer pressure and the the social pressure that comes with being in a, uh, in high school in an environment and growing up in a particular belief system and learning to to associate or at least love people from from a different one and like i think i disagree with your point about what you said in the end that it doesn't uh, it doesn't tie up that it doesn't create that resolution because i think the moment where, she, where he comes without his makeup into the canteen and she leaves the band behind and they just go off into the distance to kind of have a whatever, a milkshake or something. But the point is that that moment was, I feel like that in itself was enough because they kind of spent the whole movie building up how all these other relatively insecure kind of bricks in their own way on both sides were so insecure in themselves that they were tying these people down. Uh, whereas they end up having the strength to kind of stand up for what they feel. Uh, so, I mean, in that sense, these are the teams that kind of tied together very nicely. But that, as I completely agree, that in that sense, it doesn't explore emo uh, particularly. And it is uh, on the darker side of emo, as, uh, as Jimmy said, I would say. I think, I, well, I kind of, I agree with you in principle in terms of um, when they go off together at the end. I feel that it is still a little bit uh, like a botched landing in that case. I can see maybe the intent there, but they have pre prefaced this with uh, extensive lines of dialogue from both characters saying, we can be together and uh, I don't care that you're going to this homophobic church. Okay, uh, we can be together and you can still hang out with your asshole friend who, who, just, um, who just threw a slur at you for wearing a funny colour t-shirt. And that, that's kind of, you know, it's like dodging a 
broader point to an extent like the the universe and its political consequences don't have any kind of material impact on you as long as you have this kind of unit of two this relationship is the cure-all um and i think again it's not helped by the fact that this is a 16 minute film and uh who knows over the course of 90 minutes maybe neil triffitt really nails it um i haven't seen any of the reviews uh i saw rotten tomatoes it still has a fresh score there so on good faith maybe uh maybe he does get it right with more space and uh, more materials at, at his command but i i guess it's the difference between i mean is the thesis of this film to solve bigotry no because there are people on both sides who will continue to be bigots so and as in your social situation you will have to associate with them but is the thesis of of this film to define the choices you make when faced with social pressure in that sense i think it does it jo its job because well i mean why do they have to be members of either of those sides though if it's like a coming of age story where they both realize that they don't have to be part of these constructed groups these kind of little pockets of hegemonic ideology and they can be their own people and enrich their lives for the rest of their lives uh, together or apart isn't that a more powerful message to come away with than than this sort of like I mean I don't think the movie would have taken it to the logical conclusion as you said there was a time constraint of taking it to the yeah. conclusion of it um of them isolating themselves from their own social groups but I think it's symbolic that he he walks in without his makeup and she leaves his band in that that in itself is the start of the process of defying your own social institutions and it's never uh, it it doesn't happen overnight in any case but it can't it certainly can't be I think in a way sometimes it's more subtle in a film if you imply that the first steps have been taken um yeah. and leave it on that note in a in a comedic musical which this often is though you there could have been like even a small thing that you could have done to those people on either side to like at least give us some kind of closure on that basis i mean the ever you know, gets expelled for for like defiling someone's locker but i mean that's not really the same kind of well no so that's definitely that's not the, but i mean is it ever issue. in real life that's just assuming that it is ever that black and white i don't think the most principled of people ever manages to dissociate dissociate themselves from the family uh values there you know they they always have to kind of throw this gray area between what they believe and what and of course they can stand up and go and date a guy who's emo and live your life but you still it's never actually black and white where you make a clean break from the, the values you kind of grew up with right i mean you it is a process i would say yeah No, I'm, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Sorry, we're that. kind of leaving uh, Jimmy yeah. out of this. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. See, see this, is a, this is a point where we've gone too deep for Jimmy. Um, he's, <laughs> he's purely here for, for quips uh, and very basic level observations. I, I do think, though, just a lot of this discussion would have been almost rendered obsolete had they just not used the word fag. I'm like, my gut feeling is still yeah. like it was... Uh, I don't know if it was in, like accidental or or what it was by the director to include that word, but I yeah. don't know. It's, it's not something I I see thrown around that often, and I feel like it's it's generated discussion that maybe is almost like gone it's beyond a, what the director intended. It's a it's a box of frogs that they didn't have to open. You're right, because uh, yeah, like obviously that's not a big part of of that uh, that menacing emo character. Which seems like such a strange thing to say. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but uh, I didn't especially have to be part of the Christian thing either. Not every Christian group has to be like bathed in the blood of homosexuals, or whatever. <laughs> like you know, and there are other things that they could have disagreed about, and indeed they did bring them up about like uh, attitudes to science and whatever. There, there wasn't necessarily a need to put that in there. No, fair enough. This could go on for a while, but I think <laughs> for two points there. One is that the movie 
uh, in itself, I mean, basically rests on exaggerations. Everything in this movie is an exaggeration for contrast to get a point across. So the Christianity yes. is extra exaggerated and so is the, the emo side. But I mean, I think with the fag moment, I mean, I completely understand the negative charge that there is on that word and that's an understatement. But with that fag statement, I think what is poignant in that moment is that he, when he's, when he's about to call him a fact, there is a moment or there's many moments where he's just completely, he doesn't know what to say. He's just, that guy says something like it's an ironic fashion statement and he's just completely just blank, right? He doesn't know what to say. And so he says fag. And I think that in itself for a teenager who has built his identity up as this menacing kind of guy, it's a fairly realistic reaction to react with a punch when you're put to shame or when you've kind of, you don't have ideas. yeah when you've run out of ideas when you don't know what to say and so i think from a movie perspective it is a fairly realistic portrayal of what a guy like that would do in that situation all i'm saying is <laughs> if we want to if we want to have an exaggerated contrast of two different sides then obviously we're going beyond a little bit beyond realism obviously everyone communicates in stone that is true is it so much to ask that the homophobe gets a pie in the face I think I would have enjoyed that as well. I think that is a point we can agree on. I think. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We, we, we all come together. We've in the tied end. up all the loose ends. Perfectly done. Yes. Uh, well, I guess that brings us to the conclusion of our discussion um, in that case. So uh, first, before we get into that, um, would we recommend Emo the Musical <laughs> in its short form? Uh, I'm going to say yes for one watch. I don't think it's something I'd ever go back to, but it was enjoyable. And it did have my favourite uh, trope of clearly adult actors playing high school kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this should have been called Pro Speed the Musical. Yeah, it's like um, it's like when you watched Glee, what well, not that I'd ever recommend that either. <laughs> but like the cast was all between about sort of seventeen and in their mid thirties, and emo the musical was definitely the same. Yeah, I mean, I think I would uh, I would definitely recommend it just for the shits and giggles. I know we went deep into uh, the, the social fabric behind it, but I would say that as a movie itself, as a fifteen minute movie, it had some really nice. Uh, some really nice music I assume, of course it wasn't music that you listen to on a daily basis but it was it was well let's say it was musical uh, and it was funny and uh, yeah it was entertaining definitely so I would definitely recommend it. Um, I would give it a critical recommendation uh, I think if you go into this film and just imagine the ending but then it's bugsing alone and everyone gets pies in the face. <laughs> and then it's a much better film. <laughs> uh, so with that in mind, uh, I should like to ask you both for your pick of the bunch. Uh, what it was your favourite film of the night uh, after? Well, I mean, before that, I would, ac I would actually like to note that each of these films would have been much improved if it ended with everyone getting a pie in the face. <laughs> but uh, of the three, I think my favourite would be emo just by bare minimum of meeting the qualifications of being a musical, uh, having some dialogue and uh, being uh, long enough to uh, grip me. Nice. Jimmy, what say you? I'm going to go for emo as well. Um, not to take anything away from A Perfect Life, which, I, again, I still think it was quite good for what it was, you know, for a 48-hour time limit and the very short nature of it. I think A Perfect Life was really good. But yeah, I'd have to say emo as well. Despite like the critiques that we've had of it, it's still overall, it was a fun watch. It made me laugh. It was silly. It was obviously some parts were just exaggerated for, for shits and giggles. But yeah, it was, it was good. What about you, Ted? Who's asking about that? Who's asking about that? What? Who's asking about that? <laughs> Who's asking about that? <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, if uh, if the listeners weren't con confused before, they definitely are now. <laughs> we forgot, and especially for you, Jack. I, I think that we, you should play us out with who's who's asking about that. To be honest, Jimmy, if you can put that in as this week's titled music, I'd be I'd be much obliged. I'll, I'll tell you what, like, what I'll, what I'll do is I can send you an edit with just like short clips of who's asking about that, just <laughs> in a spare in, and we can. 
Uh, I think uh, I think that would uh, be better for all the listeners, to be honest. I think that um, <laughs> if you don't put that out there the first time, someone's going to put a petition out there saying release the who's asking about that version. Yeah. <laughs> you could just post the video instead of posting this podcast. <laughs> well, maybe. Okay, I think that brings us actually to the very last uh, piece of business. Well, you still haven't told us what your favorite movie of the Oh, well, was. I'm not allowed to pick that? Unbelievable. No, definitely yeah. not. I thought I made the rules. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. my, my, my pick of the bunch is The Perfect Life. Um, right. Because it's um, so wrapped up as a kind of end-to-end story in the three minutes and 38. I think that's a, a pretty well done thing, even if there were things that I thought about the technical execution were a bit ropey. Overall, I thought it was, uh, it was, it was the best for that reason. Uh, with a, 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 it puts it slimly ahead of Emo the Musical, which I guess on paper was the best musical. It had many different songs that all worked as songs. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they, they explained what the plot was tunefully. Um, and there were some jokes in there that, that, uh, that resonated, that were enjoyable. Obviously, Greed is, is bottom of the three, although I still am keen for people to actually go and see what we're talking about there. So yeah, the perfect life for me on that bombshell. That brings me to the last order of business then. So um, have we got anything to plug this time out? Uh, after you first, is there anything that you would like to say uh, people should go and read or listen from, from yourself? Oh, um, not that I can think of at the moment. Maybe Jimmy should go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was quite off guard yeah. there. <laughs> please, please, Jimmy, what, what have you got in the pipeline? Thankfully, we're coming out of lockdown slowly quite soon in England. So I am going to be going back to doing stand-up comedy again soon, which I'm very excited for. Uh, after <laughs> <laughs> uh Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I would say uh, if we're shamelessly self-promoting then check out my um, instagram it's after both and i post uh, videos of me singing from time to time um it was mostly a lockdown thing but i'm planning to pick it up again soon nice so we'll, we'll link to that in the um, in the description as well yeah. um plugs from me still the indie film library main event coming up we've got our annual film festival which is taking place online this year because of the coronavirus lockdown uh, tickets and the full program of some very exciting films are still available on indiefilmlibrary.com so if you head on over to there you can see all of the good stuff that we have waiting for you uh, and i would also like to take this opportunity to say that you should smash that follow button for tube rats uh, we need to bump up these rookie numbers. So if you've liked what you've heard, please subscribe, share us about. Otherwise, Jimmy will come and find you. And I'm I'm not a very nice cuddler. That's a, a very <laughs> specific set of skills that he's acquired over a long life of rejection. <laughs> must, must be crying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, that just remains for me to thank both of uh, this week's guests. Thank you, Jimmy Rudiger, for uh, being our loyal comic foil as always. Always good to be here. And after that, both, thank you so much for coming along and suffering through the horrendous, <laughs> the horrendous <laughs> list of shite that we just put up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jack. It's great to be here. It really was. Uh, and if you would like to complain about what I just said, then please write to j.rudiger at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Two Rats is created, produced, and edited by Jack Brindelli and Jimmy Rudiger. We'd like to thank Aftab Bose for being our special guest this week, and we'd also like to thank Libby Irons for allowing us to use her music. Bird.